Oh yeah, we're gonna transition down over that guitar player. That, that's me. That's uh, that's me playing with uh, my old band Miles Ahead uh, at the Lost Dog in Binghamton. Uh, that was um, February. I think I've used this before. Maybe not that specific one. Uh, we're fading down. Uh, there we go. Okay. Look at that. Oh my God. A seamless transition beginning. Yeah, any minute now the camera will cut out. <laughs> Probably. Anyway. Um, so, hey, everybody. It's, wow, it's like the uh, old home week here. Uh, we got everybody that we'd expect. Yeah, everybody. See, I, I knew that we wouldn't even wait two minutes and we'd be talking about the beard. All right. I'll get back to that. I'll come back to that. I promise. Hey, Pascal from Belgium. We're in Belgium, Pascal. I don't know whether to speak Dutch or French or try. Anyway. All right. So, hey, everybody. Um, so uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, thank, I want to thank Billy. Uh, Billy Jones is back. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Uh, Billy Jones is back. Um, and uh, Phil is still on vacation. He's, uh, he got rained out last Thursday, so he's out fishing again today. Um, uh, <laughs> and um, people are cracking me up in the live stream, uh, in the uh, chat. So uh, I want to remind everybody there's a tip jar and uh, hit the store for some merch. That's how we, uh, that's how we support the channel. That's how we keep going here. Um, and yes, before anybody else, I thought I'd get to it before somebody else did. You guys are shameless. Um, uh, I, uh, I, this is a week's worth of uh, Keith writing. And uh, it's kind of, I'm kind of getting curious to see like what's going to come in gray and what's not going to come in gray. Um, so, uh, so you guys get the, the raw Keith Williams experience today. And before somebody jumps on it and goes all, um, uh, uh, all wears the denim shirt in deference to the heat and, and these lights that are hanging right over my head, I actually switched from my three denim shirts to my three linen shirts. Uh, we'll see how long that goes. Um, I, I'm all scruffy here actually, because I'm writing, I actually took a break from working on the Martin, um, project. I, I, I know everybody's really anxious for that. Um, but I'm working on a side project that uh, is related to the short histories. I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but I'm, I'm thinking everybody's going to really dig it. And I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, and I've been doing a lot of writing on that really like, you know, eight, nine hours a day, uh, writing on that project. So, um, so today's theme, I wasn't going to do a live stream this week, but I, um, I had a DM from somebody on Instagram, a subscriber, a guy named Jose, who's in Lexington, Kentucky. Jose's probably here because he gave me permission to talk about this. Um, <laughs> okay, guys, we'll come back to the we'll come back to the beard. I promise. We'll talk about it um, anyway. Um, so, uh, and he, he asked me to do a gear consultation. I, I don't do that, <laughs> or I, I haven't done it. Um, uh, I except with myself. I, I talk to myself about the amount of gear I have and um, and really how much I have and how much having that much stuff might distract me from working on my chops actually um i pushed the guitar back but usually that red strandberg is sitting right there um and right before we started the stream uh, there's a guy busker was asking me because he's going to get some retinal surgery um and he can't lift a lot he asked me what was the lightest amp and the amp that's sitting right here is the tone master um the 64 custom is in the back uh there and um it's i'm going to come to it when as i go through each of these steps i'm going to talk about um I'm going to talk about what I'm kind of feeling at this point about where I am with the process. Um, uh, something I probably, I don't think I've ever mentioned this here. Uh, early in my career uh, in higher education, I, I was always in administration. I never was a faculty member, although I did all the coursework for a PhD in sociology. I, I'm almost over it. No, I'm not. I'm not over it at all. But um, the reality is... Um, while I did my master's degree, I actually became an academic advisor, a full-time academic advisor in an arts and co science college at SUNY Binghamton, uh, the Harper College. Excuse me. It's like Woody Allen here. So um, the, um, that gig was talking to undecided students all day, and I did it for five years. And one of the things I realized, and I said this to Jose yesterday when we were on, the, on Zoom, um, is that a lot of times by the time someone gets to the point of asking the question, uh, especially the bigger the questions in life, I think the more true this is. Um, they probably have an answer already. Um, and I think that that's an interesting thing. Um, they're really just looking for 
uh, had what a therapist once said to me was they're looking for a compassionate witness. Um, I think in this kind of a gig, um, uh, probably my Buddhism extends only to a sympathetic witness. I, I have sympathy for anybody who's going through the stuff that I'm going through. Oh, Pascal came back to say that I should try French. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit um, I'm a better in French than, uh, <laughs> than I am in Dutch. Um, so I have that gig from SUNY Binghamton where I talk to students kind of all day long about what it was that they wanted to study. And uh, we would talk about there were some things that I learned in that actually that I realized I've been applying to my own process for deciding what to keep and, um, and what to get rid of. And, and I want to say that I really have kind of come around, maybe it's the Marie Kondo stuff, I've really come around to thinking of this as what to keep. Um, I think that's a much more proactive and frankly it feels a lot better than going to what to get rid of. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. I, I think we'll probably, it's about four or six now already. So we're going to do maybe 10 or 15 minutes about this. And then I'm going to go and have folks ask questions. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of questions there already. And I'll ask Billy to help me with um, uh, pulling the questions forward when we get over to the questions. Billy, if you could pull those in. Hopefully I got, uh, I'm, I'm hardwired on the camera. So hopefully we're good here. I'm, I'm double checking the connection as we speak. It's like a Rhett Scholl kind of thing, reaching toward the camera. Um, I always tell Rhett that's the thing. Um, so the thing, like, I think the place to start, um, circling back to the conversation I had with Jose, is, um, and like I said, I'll give my answers along the way. Um, the first place I always start is I come back to why I started playing guitar. Um, there's, a, there's a TED Talk. I was a real TED Talk junkie for a long time when I was in, high, in administration still. That would be like my breakfast thing. I would find a TED Talk and I'd watch them. And Ken Robinson's talk on creativity and education and... Um, all these amazing ones. And, and honestly, I would look for the ones that had the most views. I was curious to know sort of as a, I won't go so far as to call the United States a culture, but as a society, <laughs> as a society, um, I'm fascinated with, um, with why people watch certain things, which of course is, is a little coincidental. Um, the funny part is that one of these biggest TED Talks of all time was actually not done at a main TED Talk TED conference. It was done at a TEDx conference, which are these sub-conferences. And it was done by this guy named Simon Sinek, who's since an academic, I think. And, I, and he's since made an entire career really talking about this and consulting. And the talk was about um, what it is that differentiates really uh, strong comp companies from weaker companies like Apple. So what is it about Apple that makes it uh, consistently do well? And his thing is why? So if you can, if you know that your the why question is the thing that's really carrying the day, then it makes everything else a lot clearer. Um, and that's where I came back to. And really, I started playing guitar um, so I could play uh, guitar in church with a group, play guitar with other people. Church was just the place that they would let me play acoustic guitar and God forbid, you know, try to sing uh, in public. Uh, but I was 14. And, and of course, any guy who tells you that they started playing guitar when they were 14 or 15 years old and they tell you it wasn't to meet girls, they're, they're lying, in my opinion. So, of course, that was a big part of it. Um, but that was a, that was a thing. Um, so, so why has always been clear to me. Uh, and this is the reason I'm into small group jazz instead of big band jazz, probably. I, I never played in a big band. I, honestly, I wasn't good enough in high school to even, you know, get through the changes on chord tunes and just play rhythm in the high school big band. So I didn't do that in high school. I got, I got to that later. Um, so for me, playing in a jazz group, playing in a context like that is, uh, is always a thing. Um, so, um, so, so for me, when I think about doing this, I think about playing with other people. And I, I certainly like everybody, I log thousands of hours of playing, you know, right here, um, right by this desk or, or right over there in the corner. You can see my copy of the row book one there, or as Rick Beato calls it, the wrong book one. Um, and, uh, and I started making, the way I attacked this, and I told Jose that this was a way to do it, is I would tell people to make a list of the kind of gigs that you want to do. And then you make a list of the gear that you would take to the gig. And not in a hypothetical way. I mean, really think about what you're going to have to carry in. And, uh, and really what, what's sort of a, for me especially, what's a minimal rig? that I would use on a gig because honestly, um, I've never been a toe tapping sort of wedding band guy. So I don't want a lot of pedals in front of me. I want something that's going to give me my tone and then I'm good to go. Um, so for each of those gigs, you want to make a list of the gear that you'd use. Um, and you want to think about what it is, um, 
what it is that you're going to, what kind of gigs. And I just need to say here, I think the, the rabbit hole that so many of us go down is thinking that we need one of everything because we are going to do recording at home. And we watch these rig rundowns with people like Brent Mason and, you know, and these guys, uh, Carl Verhan, these guys have everything. Uh, incredible, um, but totally not necessary. And I'll go so far as to remind us all that um, you, there are amazing players who sort of got to Nashville too late to be session players or Los Angeles or New York. There really aren't sessions anymore. If you're not Bukovac, if you're not Mason, you're not going to get called in by a record label to knock these things down. That's not how records are made anymore. That's not how careers are getting made anymore. So even the people who are at that level, that pinnacle of playing and have all that stuff, they're not necessarily working anymore. I, I, I know Rick had an a interview with Larry Carlton and Carlton basically said that scene is gone. Like he was there at the right time. And it's a shame. You see people like Guthrie Trapp, who's an amazing player and, you know, and by all accounts, you know, comes up with great parts. And he's kind of like a decade too late um, in Nashville because I don't think anybody, and he does great, you know, I, sorry, Guthrie's, a, I'm a real big Guthrie Trapp fan. Um, but I think the reality is you can't make a living doing just that anymore. So, um, so I think this idea that you need one of everything versus you need to be looking for your sound. You want to look for what it is. And so for make, fake, make your, to find your sound, if I could get it out, to find your sound, the thing that I always think about is very similar to what I used to do with the college kids. And I would say to them, make a list of all your favorite classes and then make a list of all your least favorite classes. Compare the lists and then go to the, I used to tell them, go to the bookstore and look at the, what they're going to require you to read and uh, go through that stuff. And if the stuff on the shelves for the people in the whole major isn't going to work for you, then that's probably not where you want to be. Uh, Jose was really clear about what, it, what tones really have spoken to him. He's totally a Strat guy. He's kind of coming to grips with the fact, like my editor Perry, that you know he just doesn't need this many Strats. And which of the Strats really is the one that he connects with and what does he reach for when, he play, when he's playing? Uh, I got a comment the other day, actually, in um, Instagram that somebody had gone through, actually, when I posted this, that somebody had gone through their gear from one of my really old videos and done the whole, if you haven't used it in six months and you don't plan on using it in six months, then it probably can go. And he pared down and he said he's doing a lot more playing than he used to. So if you make a list of all your favorite tones and then you, you look at the kind of playing that you'd most likely do, that's really going to steer you towards what it is you need to do it. Um, so for me, I said, the reason I started playing, the why for me was always to play with other people. Um, the what I'm going to play is probably, I'm putting, trying to put together a trio, maybe a quartet, you know, if they're, you know, it's hard for me to even imagine that somebody would hire a, a jazz quartet or a quintet anymore, but they do. People, it happens. It's crazier things happen. Um, and, uh, and God knows I need somebody to play chords while I'm soloing. Uh, I'm not really up to the do it all guy thing yet. I'm not the John Abercrombie, you know, sketch the, I'm sketching the chords, but I'm not playing the chords and going back and forth. Um, so like an upright bass, piano and uh, guitar, kind of a Nat King Cole thing without me singing. Um, or uh, I used to have a trio that was vibes and upright and guitar, which was killer. Uh, I, mean, I thought we were great. It was a lot of fun. Um, so that's what I'm thinking of doing. So, um, you know, as far as what would I carry on a gig like that, um, I'm going to take the Tone Master probably. Uh, I have an old DV Mark Jazz 12, not old. I have a DV Mark Jazz 12. This actually is more wattage and it only weighs about five or six pounds more. Um, and they both have 12 inch speakers. They both have direct outs. This has an IR out. So this is a speaker emulated out. So if I actually did an outdoor gig and they were going to go to the front of house and they needed to get it out, I can take the IR out of this. I could do that. And I have a little tiny pedal board that's actually run by a pedal train Volto um, that I don't even have to plug in. So um, I, I think that's kind of where I think that's where I'm headed. And I, that's why I'm headed there. Uh, I'm, I need a really big, fat, clean tone. Uh, I might use uh, a chorus for an organ effect and maybe one overdrive. And I usually have an EQ pedal that's also a drive pedal. I use a ML um a rocket melody ML pedal, uh, Mark Lettieri's signature pedal. It's killer. It's great. And you can dial it as a nice, really nice fat clean boost and you have all the EQ or you can dial it as a, as a drive and it makes a great sort of martial. It's based on the majestic, majestic and the blue note. So uh, that does that really well. Um, so like I said, you look at the overlap of your favorite tones, you look at the overlap of your lists and then you start looking around and you go, okay, well, what would I take on the gigs? 
not what am I, what do I love having and having it at home? And we've touched on this before, you know, um, it may be in that why category, people are just honest with themselves and they're like, I, I think guitars are beautiful and I'm a collector. This isn't about playing. It's not about playing with other people. It's about me exploring these things and exploring is great. And, you know, you're talking to a guy here, well, you're listening to a guy here who's, who's done that. I've done that my whole life since I was 14. Um, I don't know if I ever told this story. I was at, um, uh, I, I was listening to, I was playing guitar in a, in a music store, sitting on an amp, you know, like the size of a deluxe. And so I was like, my head was at about this level and this kid walked over and he was about that big. And so he's like right at my level and he kind of gives me a head nod. You know, he's really cool. His dad's at the counter buying something and he goes, Hey, I'm like, Hey, and he says, um, uh, you're not bad. <laughs> and I chuckle and I said, thanks. And then I thought for a minute and I said, tell you what, if you do this for 45 years, I'll bet you're not bad either. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so you, you do it for a while, you get to explore. Hey, Top Chat, there's Wes Urban. Thanks, Wes. I should be like J.J. Ronquillo and have like a big sound effect thing that I can do. Um, but uh, thanks, man. Yeah, TED Talks. Uh, thanks. They're, they're, these are very TED-like. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. That's, that's, a, that's a high compliment. I'm a big, I'm a big TED fan. Um, so you want to look at the stuff that you want to do and then really just look at the gear that you have that really is about that kind of playing and the, those kinds of tones. I mean, I, I, my... That's the kind of playing I'm going to do out. Um, the fantasy kind of playing that I do at home. You know, like I sat and watched Jeff McElwain's live stream as I do every every week. Um, and um, and I'm going to, you know, wind up a Marshall sound. But really, that's not a, that's not a mile away from um, the Robin Ford thing that I've been chasing for years. And uh, and I have, I've got all that, um, you know. So uh, so that's the idea. That's And that's what I went through with uh, Jose. And, you know, it was, it was classic. He really... Um, he really knew going into it uh, what that was about. He, and I think he, he seemed to think that was really good. Um, so um, that brings me around to sort of how many uh, amps and guitars and pedal boards do I really need to do those tones? Um, and that's where I'm at. Um, uh, I'm not ready for the big, big reveal. Honestly, the guitars um, are not as difficult for me as some of the amps. Some of the amps actually came to me um, from companies that I really, really love the company. And so to get rid of those kind of, and it would seem to imply that I'm like, that those aren't the ultimate solution uh, for me. And uh, that's kind of unfair. They're a perfectly good solution. Um, they're just not, I, I just, I just have a real thing about having stuff sit in its cases. Um, so, so there you go. All right. <laughs> okay. So let's go to questions. We'll go, we'll come over here and uh, I'll say hi to everybody. There's my buddy, Ben Fletcher. Ben is over there in England near uh, John Cordy, and you guys should be watching both of their channels. I watch Ben religiously and uh, try to play the, the licks that he does and, uh, and, and complain uh, when, when he makes them too hard. Um, Michael McFall wants to know why I never play on my channel. <laughs> okay, so a live stream, just to have a sense of behind the curtain here, a live stream is me doing, except for what Billy's doing, me doing all of the tech of basically making this happen and get it out. And as you've seen, I'm not that great at that. So um, to add playing on top of that uh, would be really just kind of beyond. I, I've actually, with the Friends of Five Watt, I've done a couple of live streams and I've actually played it my way into those. People are like, hey, is that you? I'm like, well, it was me until you were interrupted. Um, so that's, uh, that's something. I, if you go back to the early parts of the channel where I actually was doing some gear demos and kind of seeing where I was, you'll actually see me playing uh, back to when I had my DGTs. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do these questions in reverse order. Dean Daniel is accusing me of being his gear therapist. I'm glad to help, Dan, but I see you put up pictures of beer. Okay. Uh, no plans, Angus Potter Irwin. There's no plans for me to get a Strandberg Jazz. I kind of built a Strandberg Jazz before the guys built the Strandberg Jazz. Um, and I actually prefer uh, a mini hum uh, in the front. And I actually attempted to change it to a Firebird to even get a little more towards the single coil sound. Um, the Strandberg Jazz has a, has a full-size humbucker there. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's not something I, I'm longing for. Uh, hey, Boogie Randy. All right. Down in Nashville with his pile of Mark's, Art Mark Amps. Uh, Fuck Music says, um, no beard, no tone. That's the truth. That's absolutely the truth. I mean, I, hey, man, I grew up, you know, I was a teenager in the 70s. Guppy Bill's here. <laughs> He's a beer rep from Summit Beverage. There you go. 
Way to sneak that in there, Bill. Um, tones in the beard. You know, I'm not finding that to be true. I wish that was true. Gino from uh, Michigan. Dan Bailey from up the road. Uh, Davy Boy, Carl Smith, Cushman, talking to Krenar. That's lovely. Why is my screw go back here? <laughs> Michael McFall. Michael's commenting on my, my throwing out the Woody Allen reference. I used to do... Um, so I'm a musician, so I do accents and all this kind of stuff. And I used to do impressions uh, for fun. And I would do this Woody Allen impression, which I have to say is actually wasn't really mine. It was me stealing my friend Rob Cushing's um, uh, impression of Woody Allen. And he told me that the key to doing a good Woody Allen is to, you know, kind of, you know, your corned beef um, in your throat, <laughs> which is why I say that. That's what I think. Uh, Telecaster Bear. <laughs> Delcaster Bear says that he didn't start to doing it to meet girls. He's gay. Well, you know what? Um, I met the Indigo Girls, and uh, she handed me her custom shop Gibson, and I said something like, I started um, playing guitar when I was 14 to meet girls, and she said, big pause, and then she goes, yeah, me too, which, you know, is probably a joke that she's been able to run a million times. Uh, Jason, that's right. Start with Y. That's a good answer. CM, CMDR Lilu Catfish says it plays because it makes him smile and laugh. Man, that's a great answer. Um, Matt Murphy says he got a deluxe tone master based on my video. He's enjoying it. The attenuator is a big bonus. Yeah, actually. Uh, Steve Rule from Rochester, right up the road. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm, I got a, another top chat here. Da -da -da. Do you use alternate tunings like drop D? I actually am a big fan of drop D. Um, if I played in one of the videos, I'm trying to remember what video it was. I played a, a drop D arrangement of um, Jason Isbell's tune. That's good. See, I'm live, so I can't come up with the tune name. Uh, but a, a, a Jason Isbell tune. Um, I play 65 Princeton. So everybody saw Creenar in the stream, right? Creenar is uh, is a jazz guy. He just bought himself a jazz guitar. He's a student in Paris and uh, is a frequenter of Mr. John Cordy's uh, channel, as am I. He's asking if the Tone Master Deluxe would do jazz. Oh yeah, all all day. I mean, it's got the scoop thing. I usually run it, uh, run the bass and treble at three. I, I basically take all these directions from Zach Childs. Zach's amazing, and he's he's a, he's a deluxe guy. So I, I basically periodically reach out to Zach and say, what, what would you do in this circumstance? And he tells me. Um, and of course, I have a Celestian Neo Creamback in here. Um, so um, I'm getting distracted by somebody saying they were at Binghamton. Um, uh, so actually, that adds mids to this as well. Justin Carble says, he was a student at SUNY Binghamton when I was there. He was a student of Dr. Reitmeyer. Yeah. I, I knew all those people. I actually did a big project. I was the one who did the um, degree audit project at Binghamton. That was one of the first schools in the country to do it, and I was the project guy on that. And so I knew all the department chairmen, and then I went over to be the associate registrar from 94 to 2001. So we were there at the same time. Barrett Reitmeyer. Uh, David Cromwell saying that he's been put on extra slow mode. No, no, David, everybody's on the same. Uh, we went to a 200 second uh, lag so that we could kind of try to keep up. Um, uh, Robert Gertis says, I have an academic vibe. No doubt. I'm sure it's the glasses, but it's also um, the fact that I spent from 1983 to 2016 in working in higher education. And my dad was a college professor, actually. Uh, so I kind of grew up with it, although I, I grew up on a farm um, uh, right, right, where, near, right near where I am now. Um, in the fuzzy background, it looks like someone hacked off the neck and the bodies of my guitars. Those are Strandberg's, Donald. Donald Ruggles. Everybody helped Donald with the fact that Keith's a Strandberg player. Um, Robin Fork leaked a possible new signature PRS. It's going to be a real struggle to not buy it if it's legit. That's interesting. I'm, I, I didn't know that. I actually had, had heard wind of that. Um, and I didn't know that Robin was going to do it. He's, he used a single cut. PRS on one of his that he really likes, a red single cut 594. Um, I think that's the model uh, on one of his um, True Fire videos. He gets a great sound. And um, and he's had this love affair, this love-hate relationship with uh, Les Pauls 
um, as being his ultimate guitar, but they're heavy and they they are not particularly ergonomic. And of course, PRS kind of solves both, almost solves both of those because it's not uncommon to see an eight pound or an eight and a half pound um, single cut. Matt Murphy, love the channel. Passionately researched, written, and produced. Well, they're hard work. I don't know about passion. <laughs> um, Five Watt World mowing cap. All right, well, be careful. I had a friend that used to have his hats blow off and they'd go through the bush hog, come out like confetti on the other side. He was always looking for free hats from university. Quincy's speaking Dutch uh, to David with David Cromwell. That's good. You guys are making me feel bad. I, I need to do more time on my foreign languages. I actually could pull this down where I can see it better. I need to crick my neck. Chris Milne from Manchester. Lovely. I hope the weather's good there. I heard everybody in, in uh, Europe is melting. Uh, ben Martinez is on the Riviera, so at least he can go to the beach. Uh, let's see. Bradford, Ohio. Mason Patton. Dennis Buzko. Brooklyn, Ohio. I like that. David Belcher from Oregon. I love to see that everybody's out of work here. People are not at work. Devin Harris. Hey, Keith, brother man. Been watching the show a while. Love history and music. So where else would I be? Thanks for all the hard work. Thanks, man. Justin Carbell, nice beard, thanks. And we'll see if it lasts through the weekend. Clarksdale, Juan Blanco, Scott from Baltimore, Miles Davis, hi from Belgium, Pascal. Oh, we're getting back near the beginning now. David Ruggles in Indianapolis. Declan McCullen, McMullen from Ireland. Declan is a long, long subscri long time subscriber. <laughs> Ivan Romanenko says it's like a movie premiere. Premiere. I wouldn't go that far. Well, it's up to you. Copenhagen. That's great. This is great. We have a real good turnout today. That's wonderful. And I think I'm really near the beginning again. Yes. All right. So let's scroll back and see if we got some new questions. How about some questions, folks? What do you want to know? Um, people are asking for the PV amp history. John is saying, please do a short history <laughs> as Woody Allen. That, that would be hard, I think, for me to keep it going through the whole thing. And I, I think people have people are very mixed about Mr. Allen. They feel very mixed about Mr. Allen and, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Allen's lifestyle and his life choices. But um, uh, let's see here. Okay, I skipped by a bunch of things. Let me, let me try to catch some questions. Craig Donovan says in a slap, uh, top chat, thanks, Craig. I did what Keith went from nine. Now I'm down to a Clapton Strat and an Ultra Telly. There might be a 594 in the future, but I feel better. That's great. That's excellent, Craig. I actually think, so I, I have to say, so um, I think the, the guitars are the closest thing. <laughs> hey, my nephew, old tin cut habitat restoration and enhancement people is my nephew, Ben Williams. Uh, ben has been playing guitar since he was like 14. And it's been uh, sort of the core of the family band. Uh, when the, when my family gets together, uh, the acoustic guitars come out, and uh, and it's in in my mom's um, uh, room with the fireplace. It's basically 1975, which is pretty funny because because Ben's like you know uh, 25 years old, but he learns these tunes and he and he wades along with the rest of us for fun. Um, so he's watching in the garage. Keep keep chat going. Be over to see us tomorrow. Great. Uh, Anthony Edgar says he went over and tried a junior. Les Paul Standards, best guitar he's ever played. <laughs> Had to get it. Yeah, it is, it is a danger. You should have to make these things and not collect too many guitars. Uh, Quinn's asking about Washburns. Uh, I've never owned one, and uh, they used to carry them at Advanced Music in uh, Burlington, so I used to get to handle them. They're really nice guitars, really solid guitars. I think they just have never broken through. It's real. It, the interesting thing is a very old company. They're from Chicago, very, very old company. It actually would make a good short history because the story is great, but, but the brand doesn't sell enough guitars. I don't think a lot of people would watch it. So... Um, Steve Fine says he plays because he can't not play. That's great. I love that. That's like uh, uh, Rainier Marie Rilke, the poet. This is this uh, letters to a poet as a young man. And he basically says, you know, if you can be anything but a poet, then be that. But if you can't be something else, then be a poet. Uh, uh, 
Guppy Bill says he can't hear anything where he is. Anybody else have problems with the audio? Um, Chris Curtis Book Brooker is saying the what's the next five watt world history? The next video is going to be about Martin. It's going to be the Martin short history. We're going to do that next. Uh, Busker's asking about the new Isbell Tele Custom. You know they don't send me everything. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't I wouldn't like that. Um, the guys at Fender are usually very um, interested in sending stuff out to people that'll get out the channel and play. And as we talked about earlier, I don't actually play on the channel that much. It's not a, de a gear demo channel. Um, I have a really nice Tele, and uh, somebody lent me a, a Nacho Caster, and I haven't really been playing either of those. I've been playing my Strandberg Esquire when I want to get all Tele-ish as a broadcaster pickup. And it, um, and then my and my other Strandberg, that's what I've been playing. Oh, we got some top chat here. Victor Eduardo Lopez says, Hey, Keith, I suddenly realized that I don't need every guitar like a studio player. I think we'd be good with a Tele. I think for him, he'd be good with a Tele, a Strat, a Dual Humbug, and just one amp, a Sheriff 22, a Victory Sheriff 22. Yeah, uh, that, I could totally see that being somebody's rig. That's excellent. I'm really glad. That's wonderful. And I, I hope, you, uh, hope you had a real uh, land, uh, landslide of selling stuff off. Carl Smith says, for a general Swiss Army board, what's your maximum number of gain stages? Oh, I cheat. Um, Carl, I, I wish I could show you. I, you know, I, I'll hold it up. Hold on. Okay, so this is the board. This is the board that most days, let me see if I can get this in frame. Yeah, everybody can see it. This is a board on most days I'm playing. Um, you can say I even broke from my from my one color thing in order to add this fuzz. Um, this is a, a Rocket um, Hooligan. I think he still makes these. I think Chris is still making these. Chris Van Tassel, the guy who owns Rocket. Um, and you can see that everything's kind of at nine o'clock with these settings. You can turn the level up. At these settings, this basically does an amazing sort of dumble, kind of really liquid, great for slide, which I'm trying to play, but not doing very well. And then my ML Drive, Excuse me, and then the limited edition stop. Um, so very cool, uh, very very cool. Um, and this is what I spend time on. And the reason I say I cheat is I've got my two gain stages here, and this is more than enough gain. But I've got enough blocks. I've got enough blocks in the stomp that after I get done adding delay, because I tend to just use the reverb in the amp, and it's just barely cracked on. Um, I, uh, I I'll I'm not. It's, you can, it's common for me to add a boost. I, say, I can't even get it out. I'll add a boost. I might add a different kind of fuzz. Um, and it's funny because I don't, I use fuzz at home. That's sort of like fun for me, um, but I wouldn't do it. I would say two, I would say two gain stages. If you look at people like Robin Ford, he plays into the clean part of his dumble and he's got a Zen drive on his board and a boost. That's it. And the boost is after the drive. So basically he's got his Zen drive dialed for the tone he wants. And if he wants it to be louder, he uses the boost to raise it up without and he's got a 100 watt dumble and it's always on the 100 watt setting so it's probably not you know ever running out of headroom so all right thomas tomaso prociani proci prociciani i'm probably butchering that sorry tomaso uh tough one how do you recommend dealing with wanting to get a deal on all the gear you buy hmm you mean get a deal selling it or getting a deal buying it I mean, everybody's looking to get a deal when they're buying it. Um, selling it is tough. And, and actually, I've talked to a number of people that say they live in a part of the country where um, if they tried to sell it locally, they'd take a beating. Um, I would say now is probably the best time in the last 10 years to sell gear. Um, the, and it's just going to get better. Um, I'm hearing from manufacturers that there are they are literally um, there's manufacturers that aren't taking any orders. Um, I think I heard from uh, Boogie that they're not accepting any orders till next April. Uh, PRS is basically 18 months out, um, lack of wood, lack of, uh, hardware. Um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a year, um, uh, not a bad time to trim your, to trim the herd. Um, so, um, so I'm not sure which end of that, but frankly, from both sides, if you're willing to do online and, and ship, I think you're going to be in good shape. Uh, Cliff LeBonk says, Hey, Hey Cliff. Um, Patrick McMahon says, it's a good thing to find your scale length that works for you. For example, having strats, Gibbs really has me wanting to own my strengths and not to brands. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, strats. You know, the thing with me is um, having two guitars that sound pretty different, um, but have the same bridge and the same scale length 
and it's and it's fan fret to boot and I actually run the same strings on those I had some hand problems last year and uh, Zach Childs recommended that I try a nine and a half to 44 set and I use GHS um, so uh, so that's that's actually worked out really well and that's actually what I'm playing now oh we got more chop top chat loving this Appreciate the channel and the short history videos, collaborations with Beato and Shull. Yeah, thanks, Brenton. Um, Brenton Weathers. Um, uh, I've been talking to Rick. Rick's going to be uh, up visiting family. So we're going to do some videos. Uh, we're going to make a video or two in his hometown, uh, which is very cool. Um, it, it would be a riot. Rick, Rick and I didn't know each other when we were growing up, um, but the fact was we were kind of in and out of a whole bunch of places, in the House of Guitars in Rochester and... Um, Northfield music and all those kinds of places. So um, it's pretty funny that we'll actually now get to walk around the streets where he grew up and I grew up. So um, Muse Music says, what about what to keep? How about pretend going on vacation, which one guitar and what other gear, battery and amp? Yeah, that's a good one. So if you're going to go, what's basically what's the sound? Uh, that could be a little limiting because you've got, you know, luggage or space in the car kind of requirement. But that's an interesting experiment where you would say, what is it? And, I, you know, it's for me, it's it's uh, it's one of the things where I kind of go, well, what do I pick up every day? You know, what what is it that I reach for to play? If I'm if Jeff's live stream comes on and I reach, what do I reach for? I, that's kind of says it for me. <laughs> Chris, Chris Neiman admits that, yes, it was to sound like his heroes, but also to pick up girls. I hope that worked out for you, Chris. Best attenuation for a super reverb. Uh, I hear I don't have a lot of attenuators. I have a Captor X, and I really like it. Um, I've heard great things about the um, the Fryet and the Sir, and uh, and this is coming from uh, from Beato and uh, Pete Thorne. Um, those guys love those. So uh, let's see. I think I'm overlapping here. Somebody wants to see a PV amp short history. But it had so many models. My first stereo slash jazzy rig was a pair of PV Bandits um, with a you know with a chorus pedal, and I just didn't understand why I didn't sound like Pat Metheny. Uh, it was a, it was a mystery to me. Fast Sports wants to know if I have any advice for somebody who's very cautious, afraid of releasing their music. Yeah, I do. Um, the interesting thing, I watch a lot of videos by channels that are giving people advice about starting on YouTube because I actually, I actually wrote an entire YouTuber course for musicians and I probably will still release it because I haven't seen anybody sort of deal with the question for musicians because what you're saying is a question for musicians, but also it's a question for everybody. And the, the reality is um, when you start your channel, channel you, is the time you don't have to be worried about it at all because no one's watching. <laughs> no one cares at all. There's this um, phenomenon, uh, I think it's called the spotlight or something like that, where we assume, you know, there's a spotlight over us because we're very hypersensitive or hyperconscious of our own st self, you know, what, what shirt am I wearing? Am I going to shave for the live stream? Um, I, you know, that, that lasted about a second, you know, in the stream here. Pe people don't really they're, they're in their own little spotlights. They're worried about what's happening in their spotlight. So the, the thing about being cautious about releasing your music, um, make sure your copyright stuff is clean. And frankly, releasing it helps you with your copyright. Um, so being out there with your stuff helps, you know, um, it just helps. The, the other piece of it that I'm stammering here on is I used to be a competitive shooter. And... Uh, and I shot a lot of you know, I shot a lot of handgun, and I would shoot against policemen um, in you know competition, and uh, and I actually would turn to these cops, and I'm like, okay, you do this, you carry a gun for a living, so why do you do competition? And they kind of told me the same thing that I'd always heard about playing music, which is that you will always do in a stressful situation what you've practiced doing, um, and so if you're gigging and you're playing music live, um, there's this saying that you know. Um, a uh, night on the bandstand is worth a month in your room. I've heard this for for 35 years. Um, practicing anything where you're in competition or where you would be nervous is an important thing to do. So uh, anyway. Oh, oh, and the thing jumps. <laughs> John Gordy. 
tells us all that he's late. We know you're late, Tom. Just say hi. Uh, the Steve Rule sound, adore, sound source, Bernunzio's Stutzman's. Dude, you, you are like, we, we must have known each other. I go to Bernunzio's. I go to all those places. I, I don't now because I try not to, I, I try not to, uh, to uh, shop. Baby Ninja is here. Sassy Cat. Man, this is great. This is old home night. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Radical says wood prices are getting crazy. They, they really are. Uh, a two, I was thinking of building and a two by four went from costing $3 to costing $12.80 currently, if you can get them. Um, but that's going to turn around when they open up the border with Canada. because That's where most of the wood is coming from. Let's see. Can I show all my guitars? <laughs> uh, they're in the other room. Uh, I'll take a picture and of of the all the guitars and put it up on Instagram. How's that? I promise. Um, let's see. Gino Allen says one amp pedal and guitar. Question mark. Are you asking me or do you want people to answer? I think that would be good. If people would say that for me, it would be um, a deluxe right now in my life, a deluxe, probably the Tone Master, um, a delay and um, the ML because it gives me because it's a cheater pedal because it gives you drive and it gives you the EQ there. How's that? Um, Igor Popenko says, what about investment gear? This is really interesting. So. Uh, I don't remember how much I've talked about this. I was an economics major in college. I actually uh, was sort of a, a numbers computer programming nerd uh, in my career. So I was an analytical guy. And that started in college, though. I was, I was an economics major not because I was good at it, but because I didn't understand why anybody would major in that. And I minored in philosophy and music, which I totally understood why people would do that, having an art uh, professor dad. Um, what you find is that, it, it, except for in extreme rare cases, kind of like people that become basketball stars almost, the percentages are so against making money, making real money on an investment piece of gear. Um, it basically just holds with inflation. So if you have this sense that, um, you know, my R9, um, that it, it, if they don't completely make it obsolete by making another big leap forward and making them more like 59s, um, that will hold, you know, the current inflation rate of like 1.8%. It'll keep going up at 1.8%. So after 10 years, you start going, hey, this is a lot more money than I had before. It's actually, it's exactly the same amount of money. The money is worth less than it used to be worth. And, uh, and that's it. So there's David Burkhart. David, you, you hurt my feelings that you changed your mug picture back to away from their five watt mug. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I did notice though, you see how that works. Uh, hey, David, um, Let's see here. Greetings from Poland. Nice. Uh, I haven't played the Heritage 150s. James Groot wants to know about those. I haven't played those, but I've heard really good things. You know, the honest truth is it, when I was looking for the R9, I was kind of looking at standards as well. Um, and uh, I'm not, um, uh, I just never had a chance to find one that was lighter weight. So uh, run for it. Punker says, what kind of competition? He shot skeet in tournaments. I, I never shot skeet in a tournament. I should, I did. Um, <laughs> everyone's talking about shooting now. Cool. Um, I was a competition handgun shooter in IDPA and in IPSC bear gun, uh, bear, bear gun, uh, competition. And, um, uh, and I shot both 45 at first, but, uh, I have a, a tennis elbow. So when I went to, to offhand, you know, a, a weak hand, um, I switched down to 38 super and then I actually switched all the way down to nine mil, which didn't make, see everybody that doesn't shoot. I just lost everybody. Um, but it doesn't make major. So you always just have to go complete. You have to shoot X's all day long. And so I just practice shooting headshots there. Now I sound like a real wackadoo, huh? All, all the non gun liberals just, I just lost everybody on the channel. If there are any, um, I, I'm a gun liberal. So, uh, there, now I lost everybody else. Um, uh, I did shoot ski and I'm a, I was a, a bird hunter for a long, long time and uh, he's in his crate, but I have a, a bird dog around here, um, but he can't be, he, he'd be wandering in and out. Uh, Camden says he has a Valve King Mini and an Invective Mini, both scalable, 25.51. That's excellent. That's great. I'm big into the power scaling thing. Uh, Shivas Iron says he's starting to see guitars that have onboard effects. You know, that's that's an old thing. That's a thing from the 70s. 
Um, it feels gimmicky to me still. I haven't seen the bigger companies doing it, but the big companies, of course, are just making copies of really, really old stuff. Um, Lavish MD wants to know if I'm going to do Epiphones and Orange. Both are on the list. I've done a bunch of amp companies. Probably come back to Epiphone. Um, I'm still thinking of doing a short history on guitars of the Beatles. Uh, I think that would be good. <laughs> John Cordy wants to know my favorite Sly Stallone film. Uh, I'm going to pass on that question, John, because I, I can never come up with these things on um, on, uh, on camera. Um, but if I think of it, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back. Uh, Cliff is right. The blonde has the better speaker, which is why I swapped the speaker out and I changed the uh, firmware to be the blonde, but in a black cab. Um, History of full tone, analog man, and the growth of boutique effects pedals. Chris, I did you put this someplace else, maybe on Instagram? Um, full tone is a pretty interesting company, and I didn't realize it until um, recently. Um, uh, my friend Zach met a guy who used to build pedals for full tone way, way, way back to the point where these pedals are now, um, sort of semi collectible because they're it, his name is inside and you can tell, um, uh, Mike Fuller didn't build his own pedals. He, he was farming out the work and then, you know, checking it. And that's not such a rare thing. Um, Mike Pietro at Analog Man, that's a whole other interesting history. And I probably could do that right from Mike's webpage because it's it's copious. It's incredible amounts of information. And I shouldn't sound early familiar. I've never met the guy, um, but it feels like I, I've known him from all these things. Um, oh, we got some top chat from Litve. Is it Litve? You gotta let me know if I'm pronouncing that right. Am I gonna do Schechter? I'm not sure Schechter. Um, <laughs> Bernd Gerbel, Gerbel says he's a gun liberal too. Cool. Great. Yeah. Uh, Ruger Mark II. When I was shooting bullseye, I didn't, I actually used a pair of revolvers. So, um, I was, I was real old school. I was like, uh, I was like an old cop uh, when I was doing that. David says he's still using his five watt mug. I'm really glad to hear that, David. I feel better. I do. I'm not kidding. <laughs> David Barber, the man himself, he says, uh, he, that I just lost everybody else. He's laughing. Um, uh, I actually never have had a gun conversation with David. It's always, <laughs> we kill so much time on the phone. When we get on the phone, it's just endless um, gear nerdery. And uh, man, I cannot keep up with David. People like David and Zach are, um, are what I aspire to. Uh, Run For It Punker says I should have a nine millimeter world. If you can't, if you can't do it with a nine, I don't know what you need. Um, just, you know, you just get good at your double taps. <laughs> uh, John Webb, Webb he, uh, jumped in and saved me um, uh, and uh, gave his favorite Sloan film. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. Thanks, man. Michael Easter. Oh, we're going to go all the way there, huh? I think there's a difference between stance on guns and stance on gun control. I'd agree with that. Uh, you can change the firmware on your Tone Master. Yeah, actually, in if you go watch my deluxe um, video three deluxes. I talk about I changed the firmware. To, I updated it. You can change it. You can change the original one to the firmware for the cream, uh, the the blonde one. And basically, the one that I have here now is a blonde. I changed the speaker and I changed the firmware and it changes the reverb slope. Um, it's killer. It's great. K Smith says great channel. Keep do, doing what you're doing. You know, I actually got something. <laughs> Uh, some things um, that um, it really touched me. Actually, I, I've been getting comments on um, Instagram since I put the, the Instagram account up um, and people are basically like, I just love this. Don't stop doing it. And that's that's very touching, you know, because you, you put in all this work and it's great. It's really wonderful. It's, it's, it's fine to say, you know, we're all internally motivated, but the reality is it's great to uh, get some nice positive feedback. Rex Navarro, I think, keeps commenting that one word Gillette Actually, I actually just bought a really expensive uh, electric razor. Um, so um, anyway, I, I don't have an excuse except that I'm working. Uh, I need a second YouTube channel for shooting. Yeah, I don't have time to do my, my main YouTube channel, Ray. Ray Mears is, it's a great idea. I, I could get you guys, the gun guys here to come in and, uh, and I'll, I'll do the tech stuff and you guys can do the videos. How's that? 
uh, solid guitar guy wants to he says, no, he says I don't own a guitar with P90 pickups so do they sound the same as a single coil different I'm asking because I maybe want to buy an SG and maybe with P90 pickups P90s are their own thing uh, that's what everybody says I would say that people say that they they are someplace between it is truly a single coil pickup with bar magnets so it's not a single coil in the same design as like a fender pickup and it doesn't sound the same it has a wider magnetic field so it's taking a bigger slice of harmonic content so they sound different for that uh, I talk a lot about the construction and the sort of characteristics of P90s in the um, junior video so I'll steer you there um, there's people that build P90-ish sounding um, single coils like especially for tellies and I've played those and they're great they, they can sound great they're different they sound different they don't sound like tellies anymore really um, well they do and they don't um, I, you know whether you need one they're noisy uh, they're single coils to that extent so um, you can look ahead to that so uh, if you want to talk more about it you can always you can always everybody you can always email me um, so <laughs> uh, TCM is stocking 338 Lapua so these guys are long range rifle guys and, and you know it's like everything else I, I don't do anything halfway um, so when I was into shooting I, I read that stuff for years and years and years and um, and I really enjoyed doing that um, I, I just don't I, I haven't been doing it now because I'm just really too busy with the channel Eternalism says, Miking. see, you guys are funnier than I am. That's the most important thing to realize about having a channel is that the community is always better than me, uh, th than your, your, your content creating self. Somebody says, miking cabs with shotgun mics. I take it that's an overlap category, and that's, that's excellent. I really like that. Uh, guns and guitars go hand in hand. There's a store. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of places in the country, but there's a store. Oh, I'm not going to come up with the name. It's outside of, it's between Ogdensburg and Burlington. If you're cutting across the top of the Adirondacks, there's a store that is a very large gun store, very large guitar store and grocery store and a gas station. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. And it's so good that people drive, well, they used to, they would drive from Ottawa, Canada, down to this guitar store. And they carry Vox and they carry all these amazing, amazing guitars and, um, I wish I, I think it's like guns, guitars, and groceries is the name of the store. Uh, it's really great. Um, <laughs> everybody's, you know, plus one for the, for the gun content. That's great. Yeah. See, I'm glad you guys are being vocal because everybody else logged off when I started talking about that. Um, uh, so I got a question. What do you think about the 920D loaded pick cards? I'm not familiar. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm not near the Canadian border anymore, Ray. You you, uh, you can't count on me for that. Sure, there you go. Old Tin Cut Habitat. My nephew, Ben, j j jumps in to save the day. It's in Cherubusco, New York. So look it up, folks. Cherubusco, New York. Great guitar store. Great gun store. Uh, incredible place. Uh, I'm sure it's still doing fine. Um, Kim Stevens says, what's my stance on building pedal clones? Um, my stance on that is it's very difficult to, um, it is very, very difficult to uh, find pedals that aren't based on other pedals um, at all. And um, David and I have talked about this, David Barber. I, I'd actually like to hear David, I should interview David. If I was halfway decent with the technology, I'd do that. Um, I should work on that. I should do that because having David on the show would be great. Um, it really comes down to how different is it? What's your take? What are you adding that has always been missing? What's your um, uh, what's new about it? I'm sure this fuzz um, is is based on a fuzz of some kind. Um, but the kicker is he added to the front of it. Um, uh, he's got the the gunk control is a bias control and it's it's notched and if you turn it it makes noise and it's changing the bias um, it really radically changes the way that thing reacts um, so it's good so uh, that's my that's my stance uh, Chris Jeter says your comments are so refreshing it's a pleasure to hear the depth dimensions of you your personality life experience keep up the good work thanks thanks man 
Um, yeah, I got way more hobbies than we've talked about. You just keep coming back. We'll talk a lot more about the hobbies. Um, Gino Allen says, 920D loaded pickguard right now. Texas Special's in a strat. Sure, cool. And let's revolt plus one there for the David Barber interview. There you go, David. You hear this? You're just wildly popular. You just don't even know it. Furious Mess says, Ipsic is great training. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think it was really good training. And actually, the guy that I trained with um, was an FBI agent um, who will remain nameless, uh, but he went on to work at, um, uh, he went on to spend the last 10 years of his career as a trainer at uh, Quantico. So I had, I had the best training I could have, and I shot with the best guys. They were excellent, excellent guys. Uh, am I familiar? John says P100s, they're stacked, uh, humbucking pickups, P like P90s. Yes, they are. I did, a, I did a live stream on juniors, and I talked about the pickups that are in the Billy Joe Armstrong guitars. They're stacked. Um, they actually, in the end, I think used uh, Alnico 2s on the bottom and 5s on the top. Um, they could be split, but they did, didn't wire them that way. Um, and um, the uh, they just sound different. Um, I, I've heard, and though I have not played them, that Lindy Fralins are as close as you can get to a, um, a no-hum uh, P90 sounding P90. Um, Lindy actually makes um, P90 sounding pickups in a, lots of different sizes. Well, there you go, folks. Minimalist musician. If there was a, a more perfect audience uh, for this live stream, uh, then it would be Eric Treehaven at Minimalist Musician. Eric um, is a buddy of mine, and he runs a channel called Minimalist Musician, obviously. Um, you should check him out. He actually did a video this last week um, that was uh, inspired by my third video ever, the How Many Guitars Do You Need? And he went through his own. He kind of answered these questions, like on this on this um, uh, thing. Um, Telecaster Bear. Uh, Telly Bear, are you from up there? He says Dick's Country Store in Chattagay uh, also sells them. Um, sells them. Yeah, I know that store. I know where you're talking about. That was all kind of in that in the neighborhood um, for uh, for Burlington. Oh, we got three minutes left here. Ray Mears wants to try any amp simulators, hardware or software. Any thoughts? Well, the closest I'd get to an amp simulator is is all the Helix stuff, the the Stomp. And I haven't really gone through that whole thing. If you really want to go down that rabbit hole, you want to double back to John Cordy's channel. John is the guy who really goes uh, goes the diff distance on that stuff. Uh, Rex Navarro wants to know, how did I come up with the title 5 Watt World? I recently got a Bad Cat Bobcat 5, 5 Water, and now I use that amps exclusively. Well, that would be that would be a perfect sort of stream ender. Um, 5 Watt World was named by me in a, in a bunch of searches around branding. Um, I had had a lot of, I had built a bunch of 5 Watt amps with Dan Lurie from FYD. And I really thought 5 Watts was the amount of wattage that was just perfect at home. You would really get your foot in. You could still get some great cleans. Um, Dan was um, building 5 Watt amps for a lot of people. He was really early in the 5 Watt thing. Uh, you know, I don't want to miss this uh, top chat. Dram says, do you think getting ready versatile gear, modeler's coil, is a trap? Because you really never get happy with anything. I actually think that it, it's actually, um, it can be the opposite. It can let you taste something. Like I've been playing, um, John talked about the Route 66 model in the, um, in the Stomp, and so I was playing that for a couple of days. Um, and you know what? I didn't have to buy an amp to do it. I didn't have to reach out to my buddy, Dr. Z, and ask him to send me something. You know, I, I, so it's not here, and then I don't have to you know, think about where it's going to go. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, so 5 Watt World really was also more than just 5 Watt amps. It was actually um, an example of what's enough. And the naming of the channel, and you can see that the channel's kind of gone in the history direction. And that was me trying to learn about things and share that with folks so that they wouldn't have to buy everything. That was that's really the idea of the short histories and the whole enough theme is uh, is that's where that's coming from. So that's that's where the name of the channel came from. Um, and I can talk endlessly about branding of um, of the uh, the channels and stuff. And that's a really critical thing. All right, we got a minute to go here. Any broken gear stories? Just saw a video where a guy dropped his Gretsch and broke off the headstock. Oh man, those are painful. I, and when I've been just doing like the Explorer um, video, um, they, they were famously, you know, because you got all that extra weight from the hockey stick ending, um, they were famous. You'd like set the case down and the headstock would snap. Um, no, I don't have any, uh, you know, knock wood. I, I don't, I don't have any, or as the Brits say, touch wood. I, I don't have any. Ivan says, uh, much love from the Ukraine. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Telly Bears in New England originally, but now in Arizona. Great. Can we maybe talk about Starfield guitars? 
the side merch of Ibanez. Hmm. I, you know, I don't know that much about them, so we can. But you'll be the guy doing the talking there, solid guitar guy. Does Fender still make authentic wide-range humbuckers? If not, is there anyone out there that makes a really good version? Uh, my understanding, though I haven't used them, is that Lindy's is great. People rave about Lindy Fraylin's guitars. So, Okay, folks, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to try to do a transition out, and, uh, and hopefully it'll be smoother than the mic drop weekends, uh, weeks that I've had in the past. Um, oh, wait, Jason said he's got his first Strandberg coming tomorrow. Yeah, they've got a big announcement coming tomorrow, and I don't know what it is. Um, I, I wish I did, <laughs> but I don't. Um, but uh, everybody watch uh, for Strandberg uh, doing that, and, um, and we'll do that. So um, I'm going to fade away here. I'm going to transition to my out image. Check this out. And we're going to play some music. And then we're going to end the stream. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>